Ladies, gentlemen, and everything in between, welcome to the highlight of the week, your guidance in the world of literature. It's London, 1932, and I, Erika Appel, am your loyal host as always. This is the stream of consciousness, and what a coincidence, because that's our topic of today. In a few moments, we'll discuss the present era that we live in. We commonly refer to the 19th century as the Victorian period, but what makes us differ from them, both socially and literary? Can we see a pattern in the ideal modern poet of today, a self-taught hermit with no desire for attention? With us today to reveal those answers, do we have contemporary social scientist, Professor Dr. Lord Sir Mac Beata Johnson, and literary critic, Professor Dr. Lord Sir Mac Alexander Olofsson. First on today's list is Johnson, who will explain further what social events that may define our era. Give her a round of applause. Welcome, Johnson. Thank you for having me. If we compare the 1800s with today's society, we encounter overwhelming technology everywhere today, unlike the Victorians. Machinery in our industries cause mass production, our automobiles and wagons develop in record speed, and of course the radio, which you're all listening to now. These have contributed to a new awareness of the world, which must play a role in this new era, must not it, Johnson? Yes, the technology have made a huge difference. The industrialization has made the work so much easier for the workers. And when technology was introduced, it made it easier for soldiers to communicate with each other and people suddenly got aware of what was happening at the front line. After war, we have seen that the world had broken apart and people are suddenly questioning the meaning of things. They are asking themselves, what is real? From where do I originate? Scientists like Marx and Darwin are also unsettling people from their secure place with theories that cause ideological uncertainty. And the psychologists and philosophers like Sigmund Freud question the mind and reality by turning the mind inwards and investigating it through analysis of dreams. The war have also created a lost generation, including Hemingway, and they are struggling to find a meaning in an evil world of chaos. Instead, they are focusing on working some consciousness, as the world demonstrated that destruction is only prevented by small factors. And we are constantly on the edge of destruction, and at any point the world might break apart again. But the industrialization and assembly line have also led to an alienation amongst the humans. Alienation is caused by a rapid social change, such as industrialization. Workers are alienated because they have no claim to ownership of the products that they make. And I believe that as a result of people's identity crises, we will see a rise of populism dealing with identity and religion politics. I also see a clear rise of nationalism in Germany, which might have consequences, but it is yet too early to tell. You never know what the future holds. But there are great developments going on nowadays too, right? An increasing number of women and non-Europeans get involved in political matters, and they become more visible in the literature as well. I mean, Virginia Woolf is an eminent author with To the Lighthouse in 1927, and Mrs. Dalloway from 1925. If you haven't picked them up yet, that's a must. Johnson, what future do you see in the diverse world? I believe that the world will move forward and we will be able to see change for the better. I think that women and non-Europeans will become a frequent feature in both politics and literature. The world is becoming more acceptant to new ideas and thoughts and we can see a greater variety. Okay, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us. Now let's turn to our incredibly engaged listeners. Do you agree with Johnson? Give us a call and share our, your thoughts. Next in line is Olofsson, our literary critic, to explain how these social conditions are reflected in modern literature. Give him a hand. <laughs> Welcome to the studio, Olofsson. Thank you very much. Do you see any concrete examples of Johnson's recent input in today's literature? Well, one of the earliest and no doubt greatest writers that, have, that has followed these changes is James Joyce. This novel, The Ulysses, is completely blowing up. It even has its own international day, the Bloom's Day on the 16th of June, right? During which the life of the great Joyce is celebrated and the Ulysses is relived. 
He's a big supporter of the stream of consciousness writing technique. Oh, it seems like we have our first call. Let's find out who it is. Hello there. James Joyce. <laughs> he doesn't know what he's talking about. Ulysses might may be one of the worst books written ever. I mean, he just rambles on incomprehensibly. Even fans of the book will admit that it is almost completely unreadable without outside help. When you have to read a book-length companion guide in order to grasp the story, something has gone terribly askew. The only other comparable literary work that requires such scholarly aid for understanding is the Bible, but at least that was inspired by God. What is Joyce's excuse for such pretentiousness? Well, we'll let Olafsson respond to that, will you? But that's the beauty of his work. Its complexity is what ca uh, the classes it as the masterpiece it rightfully has been praised as. It is nothing to those who cannot put in the effort and time, and likewise to the unintelligent. For those who do have the correct, uh, should we call it, mindset, however, there is an ocean of information and greatness to explore. We're past the days of reading for entertainment, and come has the age of reading as an art form. Thank you. I hope our listener is pleased with the answer. You're known for being a supporter of this ray of writing. Tell me, how is your, uh, who is your absolute favorite modern writer? The absolute greatest writer has to be T.S. Eliot. He's my absolute favorite, and he's a good friend as well. He's a key figure in all this. It has nothing to do with the actual starting of the modernist movement. Should we call it that? Yeah. Okay, but, uh, he, he's known for picking up and leeching uh, uh, off of others, as well as being a big fan of basically all kinds of literature. He reads a lot and, had, uh, and he has had a lot of idols to look up to, uh, so it makes sense that his work would be influenced by others before him, right? Um, during one of our many talks, he mentioned that one of his absolute favorite writers was Joseph Conrad. Unfortunately, Joseph Conrad has passed away. But for those of you who don't know who he was, um, Joseph Conrad was a Russian gone Brit novelist whose work is very much assembled in that of Eliot's. A lot of the modern features that can be found in Eliot's work can also be found in Conrad's work. The big difference is that Conrad's work is dated decades earlier. It is, in fact, dated earlier than most of the work that can be connected with today's literature. We have a new listener on the line. Welcome. Hi, it's me again. <laughs> T.S. Eliot. More like T.S. Please Not. Have you read The Wasteland? Such a waste of paper. The elusive poem is nowhere near the brilliance in writing such as uh, Mary Charles Dickens. Thank God for the Victorian era. I remember January 22nd, 1901, like it was yesterday. I knew that day, even if it had been coming for a while, that literature would take a turn for the worse. Whoa, seems like our listeners are just as dedicated as always. I believe we definitely have to give this inspiring era a name. But what? I mean, it's modern, and it's in the current times, so why not call it currentism? Yeah, currentism it is. This week's program is unfortunately approaching its end, no matter how strongly we desire to continue these discussions. But stay tuned, for we might extend this theme to next program as well. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Lord Sir Mac Beata Johnson and Professor Dr. Lord Sir Mac Alexander Olafsson, who joined us today. And of course, our dear listeners, whom I wish a wonderful week. Until next time, take care. <laughs>